Now you need to lean over to your sweetie and tell her, baby, I would walk 16 for you. I would walk way more than eight miles for you because you mean that much to me. It's time to butter the biscuits, baby. Let's go. Get go. I'm giving you some chance, man. Man, I'm trying to boost you up. I'm trying to help you out. You can thank me later. Okay? But, uh, man, we, you need to communicate this message to, to the ones you love. Man, I would walk eight miles for you. I'd walk 16. I'd walk 24. Give me any multiple of eight you want, and I'm going for it, baby. And I'd swim through shark-infested waters, whatever it takes. I am with you, baby. I got you. And I'm, I would do it for you. I'd do it with you. You know, the people around us need to know that, that we heart them, that we love them. And we, got, and we got to learn how to speak to them in a way that they can get and they can understand what this love is. One of the privileges I have as a pastor is I get to do weddings and funerals. Um, if you ever see me coming your direction in a suit and I'm there in your honor, you've had the lick. You're either getting married or buried. Okay, except for today. Today. In honor of the love day, okay, I'm here. And, uh, and you know, when, when I get the privilege of performing a, a wedding, of, of being a part of a marriage ceremony, it is so special and it's so rich and it's so meaningful. And, um, and I've had the privilege of doing some of your weddings. And, man, I, every one of them is a special memory to me and all different kinds of nuances to it. But to see that love that's so vibrant and, and on, on fire and so so intentional and honest and true and with just desires to, to really love each other till death do us part. I've not, I don't believe I've married any couples that didn't have that desire in their heart to finish strong and to finish well. And yet a lot of times it doesn't go well. A lot of times what starts great doesn't end great. And today I want to give you a little boost. I want to help you. I want to give you some ideas that will help with that. I'm going to share a few ideas, but then the love panel back here. <laughs> These are the love perts, experts in love, okay? And they're going to share with you some cool ideas uh, that I think are going to be powerful and helpful. I told them after first service, I said, man, I wish everybody in America could see what you just shared because it's that helpful. It's that good. And so um, when I'm doing a wedding, it's almost without exception that we will use a passage out of 1 Corinthians 13. They're in your worship guide. If you have one of these, it's also on the screen. But this is a common passage that's usually read. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And that's true. The greatest gift in the world is love. You see it in Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You see God loving the world in many, many ways. And you see these young couples love each other really, really well. At least in the beginning. <clears throat> One of the things that usually comes with the wedding ceremony is a is a unity moment of some sort. Now, these have changed and evolved. There's all different kinds of things happening now, but, but I'm old-fashioned enough to say my favorite still is the unity candle. It's still three candles uh, that are usually lit by a mom. One of the, the moms, if they're available and around, they come and they light one of the candles right as the service is beginning. Another mom lights the other one. And those candles are burning for a while. And then we come to a moment in the service where there's usually a scripture that's read or a song that's sung. I was going to have Terry Moore sing for us today, but he wouldn't do it. And, um, <laughs> and so these, um, um, these candles represent two lives, two different people coming, you know, coming to, to that day. And at that moment of the unity candles, they'll come and they'll light this third candle, usually pick up their candles. I'm not going to risk that today. I'll just use the lighter. But uh, this candle is lit representing... Two becoming one. Here's the debate that always happens at the, at the rehearsal. Well, should we, like, leave our candles lit? Or do we, like, snuff them out? What do we do? Now, I know that many of you have done this all different kinds of ways, and I am not trying to hurt your feelings or get on your stuff. 
So please don't be offended. But let, I'm just going to share with you, again, bias and preference. This is not scriptural. This is not God speaking. This is just Jeff's bias. Okay? So listen for a moment, and I'll share with you. I think it's best, and it represents scripture well, when the scriptures teach us that a man should leave his family and cleave to his wife, and the two should become one flesh, right? One flesh together. So I think the most accurate representation of that is to is for each of them to blow out their candles and to commit to one. That they're going to commit to a lifetime of working things out together as one. They're going to burn the bridges to their old self. They're going to say no to themselves. They're going to deny themselves and focus on building a life together as one. I know that doesn't always happen. Sometimes, this is what I see happen. I see, I see one go all in. I see the other one say, in their heart at least, <laughs> uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm still me. I still belong to me. I still have the rights to me. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want to do it, regardless of what the other person is, because I'm still an individual, and I don't want to lose my individuality in this marriage. Come back to me in a few years and let me know how that's working out for you. Because most of the time it ain't working out. The practical reality is, is that when we are married to someone else, we're committing to be one with them. We're committing to let our way together be more important than our separate ways and our separate lives. I think marriages that stand the test of time go there. Usually it's the young lady who goes all in, like, man, I'm in, I'm all in. And the guy's over there going, man, I'm Mr. Game Boy. I'm still going to be Mr. Game Boy after we get done with this. I'm still going to do life the way I want to do it, and you're just going to have to deal with it because I'm still who I am. Okay, let me know how it works out for you, Buzz. Okay, you're going to be in marriage therapy pretty soon, and you're probably not going to last because at some point, if we're really going to do this life together, if we're really going to be married together, you got to blow it out. You got to you got to get rid of your selfishness. You got to kill your selfishness and choose to come together. I think this is a prescription for a great lifelong marriage. I think this is where it begins when we agree to go the extra distance for the other for the other person to walk the 8 miles. But now listen, this is what I know. Some of you walk 8, 16, 24, 32, 40 for the other person, and they just never went all in. And, it, and the marriage fell apart. You can't stop that. You can't make the other person be all in. But let me talk to you young ladies for just a minute. Listen to me well. If he won't walk one mile for you now, he won't walk eight for you when you're married. Amen. So... If you know for sure he is a loser, it's time to lose him. Sorry, or men, if you're, if you're dating a young lady who just will not get with the program and, ser- and serve you, and I don't mean like, in a, you're, like you're king of the universe, but like if, if, you're, if she's not coming halfway, if, if she's not willing to walk eight two sometimes, you got to evaluate this before you get married. After you're married, man, that, it's a mess. So just saying... I've seen it both ways. Um, I wish I could say every wedding I'd performed, even though we talk a lot about these issues and these ideas that they had made it, they don't. Because intentions are good, but life is brutal. Our intentions are, are good, but how we live it out doesn't always work. A lot of times we wind up running on empty. One of the reasons we run on empty and the reason we can't fulfill this oneness we look for in a relationship is because our hearts are empty. Remedy number one for fixing this, for fixing the problem of love that doesn't last, is that God himself is meant to be your completer. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are meant to love you first and most. And until you enter into a relationship with Jesus as your Lord, as your Master, as your Savior, your heart's going to be empty. So let's deal with this first. 
If things aren't going well in your human relationships, let's back up and let's talk about your relationship with God. Let's start there. When you go to a place in your relationship with God where you love him most and first, and when you let him be your completer, then you have excess and overflow to share with the people around you that, that you love. So remedy number one, start with the relationship with Jesus. Our team would love to help you take steps to develop a relationship with God. If you have questions about that, if that's something you've not done or something you need to reignite, then, then we would love to visit with you and help you. You can take that Connect card that's in the worship guide. Just throw that in the offering basket later. We would love to get with you and talk with you about what it means to be in a full-on relationship with God. So that's remedy number one. Remedy number two, we've got to learn to speak the love language of the people around us. We've got to learn to speak the language that they speak. This isn't just for married couples today, by the way. This is for you if you love anybody. And if you ever intend to be in a great relationship with anybody in your life, please understand everybody around you has a language that they speak. Today we're going to dive into these, to these five love languages. And they come from a book that was made popular a few years ago. And... Um, and you can find that book. It's easy. It's by a guy named Gary Chapman. It's been out for a long time. And um, I would recommend you read it, especially if you're thinking about getting married soon or whatever. You both of you need to read it and think about it. And if, you're, and if you are married, it's good, good practice. And if you want to just love people around you, well, read the five love languages. It's going to explain these love languages. Everybody around you has a love language. Even my dog and my cat have a love language. They do. My, my dog, it's physical touch. Just scratched her belly and well, she, ooh, she's so happy, okay? And then my cat. My cat's love language, acts of service. Me doing acts of service for her. Like, get up and feed me. Get up and put my water where it goes. Okay, now you can touch me. Now you can't, okay? I mean, it's, I mean that's, you know, that's it's my cat. They have love languages. The people all around you, the people you love, they all have love languages. Your children have a love language. The person you're dating has a love language. Your boss has a love language. I know it sounds kind of weird, but, but the reality is if we want to be in great relationships with people, it's important to understand these love languages. It's bitterly cold this weekend, isn't it? If there's someone you really, truly love in your life, would you send them out into this cold with just a T-shirt and a pair of shorts if you had any other way? You would not, would you? You would bundle them up if you have a child, a small child, you would bundle them up and they wouldn't be able to walk. They'd be like the penguin because you'd have them so wrapped up and bundled up because you don't want them to get cold. You're speaking a language they need to be spoken. You're providing for them. When you speak someone's love language, you're bundling them up and you're preparing them to weather the storms of life. You're girding them up and you're giving them the reserves they need to face what life is going to throw at them. When you withhold a love language... You're sending them out in the cold with just a T-shirt. And given long enough, their bodies will begin to shut down. They will suffer. They could even die. This love language thing turns out to be very important because it's how you bundle the people up that you, that you care for so that they are, so they're wrapped up. They're protected from the storms of life. If you withhold a love language, from someone you love. Their souls are missing vitamins they have to have. And they will find those vitamins somewhere. And it might be without you. It's not right, but it happens. It's up to you whether you will submit yourself, whether you'll become one or hold on to your uniqueness, whether you will serve the other person and speak their language so that you don't send them out in the cold alone to shiver. These, these folks behind me are going to tell you about the five love languages. I can't wait for you to hear from them. Erin Creekmore is going to come up first, and, um, and she's, uh, she's just going to, she's going to talk to us a couple of times, actually, but she's going to talk to, you, to us first about quality time. So, Erin, come on, tell us about quality time. Okay. I read an article this week that talked about, in the, in the author's opinion, the number one killer of relationships today. And he said it was the word busy. And we're all busy, and that's nothing new. And I think if you have someone in your life who receives love and gives love through the language of quality time, as I do, then it becomes even more dangerous for us, this concept of being too busy. When people give me their time, 
I feel important and I feel alive and I feel valuable. When I don't get time from people, I feel exactly the opposite, unimportant, invaluable, unloved, not worthy to be given something that is important. I understand how important people's time is. And so when they give it to me, I appreciate it so much. Now, if you divide it up by gender lines, men and women tend to express the love language of time a little differently. Women, we are eyeball to eyeball, face to face, close as we can get, talking in a crowded room as if there's no one else around. Men oftentimes tend to be shoulder to shoulder, doing something together like watching the ball game with no words except for the occasional throw out of grunts or something. Um, <laughs> And so, and, and you can be a male or a female and go either way, but it's important to know that you might be in a relationship with someone and share the same love language in this instance of time, but need to express it totally different. I like face to face, but that doesn't mean that just because someone in my life also shares love language, that they don't need side to side. I spend a lot of time in coffee shops and I don't drink coffee, never in my entire life have I completed a cup of coffee? And I don't care what you stick in it, and I don't care if you hide it in dessert. I thought about it earlier. If you could make it taste like bacon, I would probably <laughs> drink coffee. But I spend so much of my time in coffee shops because the way it's set up in those little tables and that atmosphere is perfect for me to give and receive this language of time. I am hopeful that one day the Thorntons will create a nice little area of tables so that I can drink my drink of choice, which is Diet Mountain Dew, while giving them my time-loving business. But for now, I'm stuck at coffee shops. Now, one of the questions we have is, what if you're not getting that love language met in your life right now? For those of us who have the love language of time, first of all, it's important to let people know that you love, that the way that you receive love is through time, so that they know to give you time that way. But also, look for God to show you how to receive that love language of time by putting people in your life that you need, that want to love on you and that who you need. So sometimes we will gravitate to people who aren't gonna love us well and we're spending our time with people who aren't loving us well. Sometimes we need to let God say, this person is not good for you. Trust him to have someone who is good for you. He created you this way. He will bring people into your life to love you through the language of time. Now I'm turning it over to Tim Gooch to talk about physical touch. People worry about Jeff when Jeff wears a suit. People worry about me when they see me wearing pants, <laughs> specifically long pants. I usually wear pants. They're just short pants. Um, and if you meet me at a coffee shop and I don't drink all of the coffee and some of yours, then it's really bad coffee. <laughs> Here are some experiences from my life. Um, when I was in college, a friend of mine named Larry came up behind me without me seeing, grabbed me around my arms, around the chest in a bear hug, picked me up and carried me from room to room in the Baptist Student Center like a sack of potatoes. Larry was a pretty strong dude. <laughs> My younger son's roommate in college, who we called Goober, came home one weekend, spent the, the weekend with us, and as they were leaving, I reached out to shake his hand, and he said, Mr. Tim, I'm not much of a handshaker. I'm more of a hugger. If you've never been bear hugged by a six foot eight, 305 pound man, it's a hug. <laughs> when my oldest son was a child, he wanted to be held all the time. In church, he wanted me to hold him all through the worship service. My arms would fatigue, and at one point his legs were long enough that he was basically standing in the pew next to me, but he still wanted to have his arms wrapped around my neck, wanted my arm around him holding him. For the past six weeks or so, my two of my aunts have been suffering a variety of illnesses, and one finally passed away this past Monday. And over the past six weeks, I've spent a lot of time holding their hands, and they've wanted me to hold their hands. Sometimes when I couldn't 
for for reasons of safety for, for me and for them, couldn't kiss them on the forehead, I could still hold their hand. After my oldest aunt passed away Monday and we had the, the funeral service on Friday, I got a text from my younger son who said, are you doing okay? And I said, yeah, I think so. And he sent back a message. He said, I wish I could give you a hug right now. When we hear physical touch is a love language, we frequently associate that with sex. That's not completely inappropriate, but when we conflate those two, we get a really messed up idea of what that love language really means because it's way more than that. And there can and frequently are people who are engaged in sex that are not loving each other. All of the examples that I gave you were ways that people loved me by touching me. I'm a, I'm, I, I hear that love language very, very clearly. After the first service, John Carpenter saw me and said, Tim, 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 come over here. I said, what, 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 what? He said, I need a hug. I said, <laughs> you got it. I, I love to feel loved that way by being hugged, by having my hand held, by having a hand on my shoulder, or just being in my space by someone that I care about. All of the love languages have kind of positive and negative sides to it. So one of the things, especially with physical touch, you need to be aware of is if you have a child that is a physical touch child, corporal punishment can be really, really destructive. Use it very, very judiciously, if at all. A very gentle swat on my oldest son's backside caused him to well up with tears because it wasn't a loving touch. He could have beat my other son until he was black and blue and he didn't care. <laughs> Be aware that how you touch people can have that kind of effect. And most importantly, listen for God's leadership in deciding how and when to touch someone. God will tell you, you can be God's hands and feet. God will help you know who you should touch, how you should touch them, to bless them and love them. And now Judy Mosley is going to talk to you about gifts. Hello, um, I'm Judy. Can I put love per on my resume? Is that good? I think that would open up some really great opportunities. Um, my love language is gifts. <laughs> um, yes, my love language is gifts. I love getting gifts. I love giving gifts. Um, it's very much what, what fuels me. Um, and how it fuels me is that I'm, when someone gives me a gift that reflects my personality, what I like, I feel seen. Um, a friend of mine, when she moved away, and we were very close friends for years, she moved away, and um, I missed her very much. And she sent me a coffee mug, and it had a lemon tree on it because at the time I was drinking lemons in hot water, weird, whatever, but it's what I was doing. And she told me that she misses the coffee time that we had together. And that when she saw this, that I came to her mind. Um, hold on just a second. Before I had kids, I did a lot of rock climbing. And I miss it. And I miss it a lot. But for this year, for Christmas, my husband gave me my first pieces of equipment. Because he knows I love it. And he doesn't want me to forget that desire. And that means a lot because I tend to stuff things if I don't get them, which is not okay. Um, because when, and I don't have to have a gift every day or every week. Um, if it's been a year, that's not okay. <laughs> but, um, but I also grew up in a household where desires 
weren't listened to. Um, it didn't matter what you wanted. Um, my around Christmas and birthdays, my mom would ask us what we wanted and we would give her a list and she'd give that list to my dad and he would not buy any of it. So that way it would be a surprise, which meant I didn't get anything that I wanted. <laughs> um, and that instilled in me that it, it, it's not worth it to ask because what's the point of asking if you're not going to get what you want? So I've had to learn how to come out of that. And even in my relationship with God, that I can ask God. And a great example of a yes is um, two or three weeks ago in church, I just leaned over to my husband and I said, I really need, I need a man bag. I'm, I'm carrying all these stuff these days. I have my laptop and my phone and, and I, my purse, my girly purse isn't cutting it. And I just left it at that. And on a whim, I went to Goodwill that day and got my man bag with a teal liner. So I really appreciated that touch. Um, but I call this my Jesus bag now because it reminds me that God is listening. Jesus is listening. And he does care. And it's, it's beyond what I really know. Um, and that if something, if a gift, if I ask God for something and there's a delay or, um, yeah, if it just takes time, one, it may not be the right thing or it's just the right thing and not the right time, which that's just taken a while to mature in me. Um, and I do want to offer a word of caution in all of these love languages is that don't give someone their love language to get something from them. Give them their love lang language because you love them. Doing it the first way just to get something from them, that's manipulation. I have done that to people and I've had it done to me. And no one wants to, yeah, it doesn't work. Don't do it. Um, but love them the way that they receive love because you love them. And that's it. Um, so, yeah, next is Terry with Acts of Service. Judy's words were right to my heart. Because when I started my walk with Christ, and I wanted to think about uh, acts of service that I would do, I had this idea in my head that uh, I could trade with him. You know, if I went on this mission trip or if I did this thing, whatever it would be, that uh, health, wealth, and prosperity would arrive at my door. You know, I'd go to the mailbox and open it, and I just knew that check would be in there because of some mission endeavor that I had been on. I would try to trade uh, that way. What I noticed as I matured in my walk with Christ was he didn't operate that way. His father, he being the son and the Holy Spirit re that, that resided in me, didn't give or do things for me or do acts of service for me that way based on anything that I had done. They just came. They came out of his love for me. And I thought, okay, you don't trade. How's that going to translate into my life? How am I going to start doing acts of service? And I started watching with my wife's, our, our relationship, our, our, we've been married 32 years. And I started with a, looking at her differently looking at a different way that I could do acts of service for Kim. And I started looking at her life in this respect. Were there things that I could do that would just make her day better? That would just, just encourage her to have a good day? Just, 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 just for, for the fact that she'd have a good day. Not anything in return. Not a trade later, but just making her day better. So I started by some mornings when we get up, we try to eat breakfast together. And as she leaves and she goes off to work and I've got to go off to work, we'll stand and I get to wrap my arms around. 
And I'll pray a blessing over. The reason why I pray that blessing over is that sometime during their day, I figure it's going to be answered because I prayed it over. And she knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that the father has been with her all day. And it's just neat to see that answered. We started doing that with our kids. When they leave, I'll pray a blessing over them. Uh, just so they'll see when it's answered. It, it's so neat to see that, that answered back, that, that, that they've got that affirmation. It expanded further into my life. I have a business partner that I've been in business with for 20 years. I started making a, just a determined effort that, that when we would go to work, I'd do whatever I needed to do so that he'd have a good day. If I could go to the truck and get a tool, I'd go do it. If I, Anything I could do that would make him have a good day and not to hear, that a boy, Terry, you're doing those good things for me and I recognize it. No, I don't ever hear it. I don't, I don't do it so I hear it. I do it so he'll have a good day. A good day. And then I got to see how the Heavenly Father works through all of us that way in acts of service, not based on a trade, but just because he loves me. He loves me so that I can take that and give it away and be joyful in it. My acts of service now come out of a joy of being with my Father, with his Son and his Holy Spirit who resides in me. It's neat. Aaron's going to come and talk about words of affirmation we all need. Because some of us are so needy, one love language isn't enough. I have two. That's actually very common, though. It is common that you'll have a primary love language and a secondary love language. And even though I have a primary and a secondary, I don't mind receiving gifts. I have never told anyone, please don't wash those dishes. That's an act of service. I don't like to be loved that way. So it's not uncommon to have a lot of different love languages, and especially for children. You may start to see some inklings about what their love language is, but they kind of eat up all the love languages until they're a little older. You can usually start to figure out which one they're more inclined to. My primary love language is words of affirmation. This is the love language that fires me up. This is the way I love to love people and love to be loved by them most. There is nothing I enjoy more than building people up with words, than sharing with them encouragement, with um, positive praise, with telling them how wonderful that they are, that they're valuable because they were created by God. And it goes so close for me with time, which is not uncommon for time and words to pair, because I get to sit face to face and fill them with the life of of words. Now, when I was a young child and in my teens, I understood that I loved being praised and I loved receiving positive words, but I was a bit ashamed by it. I felt like it was sort of needy or attention seeking And so I didn't know exactly what to do with wanting to be loved that way while not wanting to appear needy. So I started um, a lot of performance, um, getting good grades, doing something that would make someone proud of me and doing anything I could to avoid a negative word. I never wanted to hear that people were displeased with me. And I created in myself a horrific problem of people pleasing. And you, if you have the, word, the love language of words of affirmation out there, I just want to affirm you that God created you this way and there's nothing wrong with you and you're not overly needy and it isn't as glamorous as Terry over here who's out and about serving the world, which is awesome. But the way that I receive love in, is, is when people tell me um, through words or text or cards and notes how they feel about me. So if I've been breaking this people-pleasing problem for like my whole life, and I'm still working on it, but I want you to know God didn't create us to seek the approval of man. He is pleased with us, delighted in us, in fact. And he created us exactly the way he meant to create us. 
one of the ways that I can get filled by God when maybe the people in my life aren't filling me the way I want or I'm feeling like I need to seek it out more is by taking scripture and turning them into first person speaking to me. Sarah Young did this really well when she wrote the um, devotional Jesus Calling. She takes scripture and she writes devotions as if Jesus himself is speaking directly to you. So if I look at Jesus speaking to the Hebrews or God speaking to the Hebrews in the Old Testament, let's say, I will turn that into Aaron. I am going with you no matter what you do today. Or Aaron, I see you fell short, but I know you tried and I'm proud of your effort. And so I encourage you as one way to get that love language met is to try taking some of the scripture, the whole of scripture is this amazing love letter to us. And so just to personalize it to yourself. Um, a quick word about teenagers is that um, teenagers don't really do a lot of face-to-face -face, um, like we were talking earlier. So if you have a teenager in your life and you wanna build them up and you wanna have conversation with them and spend time with them, drive. Drive with them, maybe not them driving if that makes you nervous, because then you won't be focused. But there is something about just spending time with everyone in the car facing forward that can really um, create an opportunity for conversation and an opportunity for you to pour life into them that you might not otherwise have. And I think with that, I'll turn it back over to Jeff. You know, in all this, if we're going to, um, if we're going to love other people well, requires um, one of the most powerful concepts in the world. It requires submission. Not a popular word, but a powerful word, powerful concept. Jesus was so powerful in his life and so useful to his Father in living out God's will and therefore loving us because he lived a life of submission. His mission was put under the mission of his Father. He didn't cling to his life as one, but he was united fully with his Father. In our relationships, especially in our married relationships, most specifically in our marriage relationships, this idea of unity, of being one, of letting go of yourself, so vital. So let me share with you some scriptures I think you'll find useful today. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Then wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. This is not about power. It's not about control. And it's not about trading favors. It's about loving someone else enough that you would lay down your rights that you would walk the eight miles, that you would do whatever it takes to wrap them up in a way that they are loved and they know that they are loved. Your relationships will all change if you'll let go of yourself. Be filled up with Christ and out of that overflow, love the world. Live by not just the golden rule, but the platinum rule. Golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Platinum rule, do unto others as they'd have you do to them. And you'll see the relationships that matter most to you transformed as you learn to be submitted, controlled by the power of Christ. Love them enough to speak their language. Let's pray.